okay known for the live lecture as well as the recorded lecture today okay so the chapter 5 is uh, digital filter design and i'll be going to how we choose between a fir filter and ir filter and then the design techniques and we will look at the ir filter design couple of methods we will look at it and then we look at fir filter design as well and then the last one is the frequency sampling filter so there are there are also the three aspects there FIR filter design, IIR filter design, frequency sampling filter as well. The special type of filter this one is, and come back to you for certain application you use them. Otherwise, you only do IIR filter or FIR filter. I'm looking for FIR filter here. Okay. Okay. So when you are designing digital filter, basically you have a transfer function over digital filter, and when you say design that means you are trying to find out these values and also the order of the filter as well how do you find these values it's actually the design these values determine whether the filter is a low pass filter uh, or band pass filter or high pass filter or band stop filter so it it, it actually determines so in this case this this is an in this case this is an IAR filter this one is an IAR filter and this one is an FIR filter so when you design those two filters you want to the first you have to make a decision which one are you going to choose are you going to choose IAR or FIR filter that's your choice so you need to know some properties which one you want to choose you need to decide So which one you are going to go for it? And so we are going to choose which one. So I will show you some of the properties of these filters first. Before we choose the filter, you need to really know performance specifications, which you already have looked at in Chapter Four, which is analog filter design. In a filter, if this is a digital filter, we are going to look at, and we can see this is digital filter frequency. and also i have put in the analog frequency axis as well so you can see actually where you have this low frequency pi which corresponds to half the sampling frequency if you take a low pass filter you find you got a pass band then you will have a transition band and then you have got a stop band if you want to make this filter very sharp like that very hard to do that then the order of the filter just increases now when you are designing a filter you have to make sure what sort of ripple you are going to have you can't get flat very flat not easy if you have part of a filter yes you will get a flat very flat but you normally have a small ripple very small ripple and this is exaggerated and we say the flat point is 1 and anything about 1 plus delta 1 minus delta and then and then from here the stop band which is delta 2 which is 20 log delta 2 and which could be minus 60 db or minus 20 db depends on how much you want to have the suppression and then on stop band if you draw a line in the stop band all these ripples should be below the stop band so you really have to decide what you are going to uh, how you are going to define the filter so what you need to provide is in designing what is your cut off frequency what is this cut off frequency what is your sampling frequency you have to provide and then you have to provide that value and also you have to say how much ripple you want 0.01 0.01 right 0.0001 which is convert them into db or 0.01 if you go for the difference between 0.01 and 0.001 it's going to be the order of the filter if you say you could you allow the higher ripple here then you can reduce the order of the filter if you go very like flat very small ripple then you increase the order of the filter and this one also the same thing 
If you say you only want minus 20 dB, the order of the filter could be fifth order. But if you say 60 dB, it could be 20th order. Right? So we will look at all of those and see how we, uh, how we design. One means here is 0 dB. Okay? All right. Let's move on to the next one. Everything I have explained earlier is given as kind of a simple equation where you can see the magnitude response in the path band should be less than 1 plus delta 1 or greater than 1 minus delta 1. Theta L is the path band. Similarly, in the stop band, mod H theta should be less than equal to delta 2, which is in this range. Now, choosing between FIR filter and IAR filter. When you are choosing filters, okay, if you look at the FIR filter, it only contains zeros. You already know by having only zeros, then filters are always stable. IAR filter, you will always have, unless an old port filter, you will have holes and zeros, but it must have holes. Then FIR filters non-recursive, that means there's no feedback possible. However, we will show a structure under the special condition of FIR, it can be it can be drawn as a recursive filter. Don't concentrate on this at the moment. We'll come back to that. Under special filter condition, filter va coefficient values, we can actually implement an FIR filter as an as an IAR structure. FIR filter can have exactly linear shape. The implication is that no head distortion interaction in this filter, uh, in the signal, when the signal passes through the filter. Now, if you look at the IAR filter, they are non-linear. Their phase are non-linear. It's very, very hard to get a uh, um, linear phase filter. And then it comes to the point of a uh, limited number of bits that you use. Because you have got FIR filters zeros, if you use limited number of bits, the zeros could come outside the unit circle. If it comes, it doesn't matter. Still it's stable. Whereas, if you take IAR filter, and if you do quantization, if you have only number of bits, only few number of bits, and if you do quantize them, you will find if you have a pole here, and if it doesn't get enough number of bits, it will move out. When it moves out, it becomes unstable. Therefore, that problem is there. So when, if you are going to go for IAR filter, you want to make sure every coefficient is represented by enough bits. One of the problems with FIR filter, this is the major problem, is that it requires more coefficients for a sharp cutoff filter than an IR filter. So let's take, like here is a filter shape. And if you design using FIR filter, you may need 50 coefficients. And the same filter with an IAR, it could be only 10 coefficients. Therefore, if linear phase is not an important part of your filtering process, then always go for IAR filter because all you need is less coefficients. You don't need many coefficients for. That's one of the attractive properties of the IIR filter. FIR filter always requires more coefficients for the same characteristics that you are trying to implement in both ways. In this case, FIR filter complexity is proportional to the impulse response. Because what is the impulse response? In impulse response are the coefficients of the FIR filter, isn't that right? If you write the FIR filter yn is equal to a naught xn plus a1 xn minus 1 plus and so on and so on, the impulse response hn, when you give a delta, the first, first value is a naught, second one is a1 and so on. So the complexity is proportional to the length of the impulse. That means the order of the filter is same as length of the impulse. 
And there's no relationship between the complexity and the length of the impulse response here. You can't. You can't say that in this case. The other part, characteristic is, FIR filters have no analog counterpart. That means you cannot design an analog filter and then come from that filter to an FIR. You can't. So if you have an analog filter, for example, if I start with an analog filter, Take here, here's an analog filter, 1 over x plus a, take an analog filter. Using this filter, which we will be learning in a minute, we can find out a set transform, which is a digital filter, which could be 1 plus a, 1 set of minus 1 over 1 minus a, 1 set of minus 1. So it will be always an analog filter gives you an IAR filter. An analog filter does not give you an FIR filter. So you, if you want to design an FIR filter, you cannot start with an analog filter. Okay. So you, only for IAR filter design, you must start with analog filter if you want it. FIR is a different technique. Let's move on. Let's look at this particular example and uh, how normally you are given the characteristics. An FIR filter is designed to meet the following sequence response specification. Normally, you will get normalized uh, values. They say pass band is between 0.18 and 0.33. What does that mean is, uh, this is not a low pass, it is a band pass. So, it's like, there to there is to a uh, uh, pass band. The idea is that you always say your half the sampling frequency is equal to one. Um, yeah, you have your half the sampling frequency one. So, and then based on that, you in an analog filter you don't have it that way. Analog filter, you, what do you do? You, you you normally take the cutoff frequency as you normalize to, uh, to the cutoff frequency, yeah? Here, actually, you normalize it not half the sample because you normalize with the sample frequency. Okay, we'll come back to this in a second. So, all these values are given as, as like, n normalized values, and we need to calculate, uh, these are not normalized, these two are the normalized values, x-axis is the normalized. We need to actually calculate the, first you draw the graph, um, the frequency response, and then you need to, Express all these um, values in frequencies, not as normalized values, because we don't have frequencies here. If you normalize them, you are dividing by something. So what you do is, if you look at the next page, you see the whole lot. Here is the filter given. It's 0.18 to 0.33 is the pass back. So basically, you can see this is what sort of filter this is. This is the band pass filter. And then these edges are given and this is 0.5. So what you do is, because you have to normalize by the sampling frequency, not half the sampling frequency, that was an error what I said earlier, is you have to divide by FS, you will find, if you want to actually find the frequency, you just multiply by your sampling frequency, 10 kilohertz, and you get this is 1.8 kilohertz to 3.3 kilohertz. And stock band is 0 to 1.4 kilohertz, and then, the other side is 3.7 to 5 kilohertz. Stoke band attenuation always has to be minus because you're going to come from downwards. So if you take that is 20 log 1, which will be 0 dB, that line, that line will be 0 dB. So from there down, so <coughs> you have minus 20 log. And <coughs> it is 0 0.001 that we gave, so that gives you minus 40 dB. And pass band ripple, you want to find out what's the maximum pass band ripple. So it's 1 plus delta 1. So 1 plus delta 1 is 1 plus 0 0.05, 20 log again, and it's moving upward. Therefore, you don't put plus sign here. You don't put minus sign. You put a plus sign. Well, you don't need to do it. Just So it's 0 0.42 dB. So this specification, if you go back and it tells you, what it tells you is for a designer, this is what it tells you. You want a pass band between 1.8 to 3.3 kilohertz. You want to have a stop band 
between 0 and 1.4 kilohertz and 3.7 and 5 kilohertz. Then your attenuation, this one, should be minus 60 dB from that point. And then your ripple here, that mark is 0.42 dB. This ripple is very high, 0.42 is very high. That means the order of the filter is going to be very small. Now, if you go for this one, 0 0.01, which is very low ripple, then the order of the filter goes up. When you do the design later on, you'll find those. So, here is an example. <coughs> you can look at this design example, and uh, we're not actually designing, but just to illustrate the example. So, the following terms of function represent two different filters meeting the identical amplitude characteristics. So I've got two filters, one FIR filter, one IAR filter. Here's an IAR filter. has got one, two, three, four, five coefficients, and the coefficient values are given. Now we take the similar uh, uh, FIR filter, produce the same frequency response, and if you define the FIR filter, it, you need five linear phase in the asymmetrical. You need altogether 12 coefficients. So this illustrates the principle. If you want a one particular frequency response, you, if you use the FIR filter, you need more coefficients than the IAR filter, which you show, which you, just now you had a look at it, which only needed one, two, three, four, five coefficients against 12 coefficients. Just a simple example. And then now, if you draw the filter, and uh, this is the filter that you have, that's Naya filter, and, and that's the equation. And if you go, this is your FIR filter with the 12 coefficients. So both filters give you same magnitude response, no different. But FIR filter needs more coefficients. Now, if you look further, and see just individually and see the properties. Because you have got 12 coefficients, you need 12 multiplications. Is that correct? Because you have got 5 coefficients, you need 5 multiplications. Number of additions, you need about 11 additions. You are assuming like only addition, only 2 input, 1 output addition. Right? And if you assume you have got multiple, then that will be reduced. And the same principle, here is 4 additions you need. And number of storage locations, 24. Why do you need 24 locations? You have to store, basically, 12 coefficients you have to store. That's 12 locations you need in memory. And then you've got 12, 11 previous values you have to store. Isn't that right? In FIR filter, y n minus uh, x n minus 1, x n minus 2, 11 of them. So that's 23. Then you store either one input or one output, whichever the way you want. Other one comes out. It's about 24. And uh, if you do the same thing, you will find all you need is about eight, eight uh, coefficients. So you will find FIR filter is. Uh, what he, What is your opinion on this uh, FIR filter? What's the What's the uh, What is the uh, What do you think here? Anybody who wants to answer? Yes? Any answer? Would you go for this or would you go for this? Depends on the application. Depends on the application. Just choose an application and tell me which one you would go for. Yes, because you need linear phase filter. Very good. If you want a jam filtering, you are not worried about phase, you go for <laughs> IAR filter. Okay? <laughs> Anybody else want to interact? You will be on the CD. <laughs> yes? Supposed to be an interactive session. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Right, design techniques. We are going to look at design techniques now. 
and the sign takes me to be going to have the FIR filter design and IR filter design. But there are many design techniques available. If you do later on signal processing tools, you will come across other techniques. But initially, we want to learn windowing technique for FIR filter design and some frequency sampling technique we want to learn. This you will do next year if you choose signal processing uh, subject. That's the optimization method. In IIR filter design, we will do impulse invariant transformation. We will do bilinear transformation. And simple filters can be designed using four zero placement, which we have already done, but I'll just touch on that later on. So these are the three techniques, and here are two techniques that you, need, you will be learning in this particular chapter. Basically, this chapter is dedicated for these five sections. And you will use these sections to design filters, uh, whether FIR or whether IR filter, and uh, ha having particular characteristics. Normally, in, in these filter designs, especially in IR, uh, FIR or IR filter design, we can, um, well, we go for IR filter design. We normally try and uh, start with a low pass filter, design the low pass filter, then we use a transformation technique to get the corresponding IAR or, or corresponding um, uh, high pass, band pass, band stop filters. So let's start with IAR digital filters and impulse invariant transformation. That's the first section now. So we will do this one and that one. So I've just mentioned here, depends on the application, depends on what you want, you select the filter that you need. <coughs> so we are now going to look at IR filter design. So as I mentioned to you, to, to do an IR filter, you start with an analog filter, it's a simple filter, and you translate that to a digital filter. That's the normal. So we will always start with an analog filter. So in this case, what we are trying to do is get from analog filter, we are trying to, analog filter is a part of function of HS, we are trying to get HS. So first you will use the knowledge that you have gathered in chapter 4, which is analog filter design. You should know how to do that first. Once you know that, you apply transformation technique and you will get them immediately the digital filter. Okay, we will do some examples in a minute. We normally start with a stable analog filter, and if you use the proper transformation, we will get a stable digital filter. That means all the pores on the S plane must be transferred to, in the set plane, they should be inside the unit circle. So if you have, this is your S plane, and your pores are here, and then if you go to set plane, and the pole should be inside the unit circle. Then only you will get a stable filter. So the transformation that you're going to do, if it's not a proper transformation, you won't get a stable filter. That's one of the things. There are many transformations available. That I have only selected two, which are the best ones. There are 20 transformation techniques there. But they do not all warranty stable filter when you translate. So you are in one domain, S domain, you take the transfer function, now you're going to move from there to the Z domain, and you want to make sure all the pores that you have in, in, in the unit circle here should be transferred across by the transformation. So the first technique is impulse invariant method. That's what we are going to do, first technique. So in the impulse invariant method, what we do is we start with an analog filter, and its impulse is called HAC. So we first have to find out. So what you do is you start with HAS and you take inverse Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform to get HAC. That's what you have to do. You start with the um, analog filter and take this inverse Laplace transform, you get HAC. Then what you do is you then sample this. That's why it's called impulse invariant transformation. You take the impulse response on the analog filter, which may look like this, like, and now you want a digital filter with the same impulse response, so you sample this analog filter. We know how to sample this. We have learned 
if you have got an analog equation handled before digitally. So what you do is your digital uh, impulse response is basically taking your analog impulse response and replace variable T by N T, which is the sampling technique, and you get a digital a digital impulse response. That so the characteristic property that you get is is the, the, the resulting digital filter is a sampled version of the impulse response of the analog filter. So the next slide should show that. Here is your analog filter impulse response. Here this is. And you want the digital filter with the same impulse response but the sampled version. So you go here, you know the equation of a HAT, and you substitute T is equal to NT on the equation. You get these are the values, you get them. And then you write the equation for this. So if you if you say H A T is equal to e to the, for example, minus a t, your digital version is going to be H N and is equal to e to the power minus a n t. That's your discrete version. Basically sampling that. So you find if you if you look at the frequency response, you find if this is your analog frequency response, which normally go up to infinity, yeah? Because you are sampling, so wherever half the sampling frequency at that point, you put your original spectrum, which is that spectrum which comes here. Then at the sampling frequency, this spectrum will sit like this, and it repeats. Now you will find this will going to interact with this one, so there's going to be aliasing. So this technique is a very, very good technique, very simple and effective, but it will force, force some aliasing. So what you have to do is you want to avoid aliasing in this case. If you want to avoid this part, see, that part, you don't like it, that's aliasing. What do you do? What do you have to do? <coughs> what do you have to do? Yes? Higher sampling frequency. Round of applause for him. So all you need to do, move this sampling frequency far away here, so it will be like that, it's basically very little there. So if you want to move from here to here, you make sure you really sample very high, then you can avoid aliasing. Okay? That's important. Impulse invariant transformation is a very simple way of doing it, as long as you use higher sampling, okay? So I mentioned here sampling frequency affects the frequency response of the impulse response, and a sufficient high sampling frequency is necessary to avoid aliasing or to get exactly the same as analog filter. So because of aliasing, no matter what you do, even if you move very high, there will be always a little bit of alias. So therefore the digital filter frequency response will never be exactly mapped on the analog. But for the band that you are looking at, it might be fine. So for example, here's your analog frequency, digital frequency response, right? This is your, this is the analog frequency response. Let me write down. That's the analog. And your digital frequency response matches all the way through here nicely, and then here it goes up a bit because of aliasing. That's what will happen. But if you are only interested in this region, you are only worried about one kilohertz. Your signal is only, you want to filter only up to one kilohertz. So you don't need to worry about this part at all. That part comes into play if you are interested in the frequency in that region. They're not interested in that region, you're only interested in the region. You can allow the area thing to happen, but that doesn't, you know. So you just have to be careful and look at the application which you're trying to do. So, next part is that I've explained to you what is impulse invariant transformation. Now, we can say how do we find the filter quality of the IR filter. How do you find the filter coefficient? So let's look at the next 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 slide. This is how you find the filter coefficient. Because at the end of the 
Today, when you do design, you are trying to find filter coefficient that's all. You have to. Digital filter coefficient. You need to know. So far, I gave you the coefficient, you just manipulated and brought the frequency response. Now, you've been told this is what the frequency response is. Find the filter with the appropriate coefficient. That's what's called digital filter design. Okay? Let's start on this simple example. What sort of filter is that? That's an analog filter. What sort of filter is this one? What sort of filter is this one? Low pass filter. Yes, anybody else? Anybody else? Why? Why do you think it's high pass? It is a low pass filter. The high pass means it will have S on the top. There's no S there. Yes. <laughs> low pass. I thought you were done on this last year. S plus A. High pass. S so by X plus A. Bad pass. 1 over S squared plus B S plus omega T squared. Well, you can have anything. Just put a K there. That will be a, that will be a low pass filter with a little bit of resonance. To make it more band pass, you need to multiply by an S there on the top. S means just bring the zero frequency. If you don't have the S, it will look like this, you know. It will go like this nicely. That's not a band pass. Isn't that right? Is it a band pass? Why? This part, this part will give you this. Yep. As soon as you put S there, what happens? As soon as you put the S there, what happens? S means J omega. When omega is zero, this whole thing is zero. So that is, by putting S there, it brings this fellow down here. It goes that far. Does it make sense? Oh, so I'm recording. Sorry. Yeah, yes. Does it make sense? Yes? Okay, okay. <laughs> right. Let's go on. So that's just, you need to know that. You need to know that. You're going to be engineers and people are going to ask you, people need to ask, you go for an interview, they say, right, have you done Laplace transform? You say, yes. Okay, here's an equation. Tell us what equation you think it is. <laughs> what would you say? They could write all those. Okay, anyway, never mind. There's not many analog design engineers available nowadays, so no need to worry. Okay, here we go. This one. So the impulse response with the in inverse Laplace transform, if you do that, you take inverse Laplace transform, that's what you get. H A T equal to e to the minus B T. I've scribbled a lot, so I just take it out. Okay? So you, you start from there, you take inverse Laplace transform, you get e, e to the minus B T. Right. Now what you have to do, you substitute T by N T, so you get your new sequence, which is, well, we don't normally write this here, we normally write H L e to the minus b and t. So this is your impulse response of the filter, which is e to the power of minus b and t, where n is greater than zero, and is zero when uh, n less than zero. If you now look at the self transform table for that, it will be this. H sat will be equal to one over one minus e to the minus b t. So the coefficient that you are looking for, this filter, H sat, is equal to 1 over 1 minus a is set to the minus 1. The coefficient a is here the coefficient e to the minus b t. The coefficient a is equal to e to the minus b t. Very simple. That's how you calculate the coefficient. Okay? So if you are go going to use this uh, example, in this uh, uh, transformation, Always what you will do, wherever you see, can I go back? Wherever you see in the analog filter that part, you will replace that by that part. Because you know an analog filter of that form is, gets, gets to this one. That exactly is an impulse invariant transformation, and which is mapping the analog frequency response exactly same as the so analog impulse response, same as digital impulse, impulse response. They will be exactly the same, 
But the second response won't be the same. Am I right? You are impulse response, analog, that's that, and your digital are exactly the same. But your frequency response won't be exactly the same as analog and digital. Why? Because of alias. Because of alias, it will be the same all the way through there and then start, start to deviate a little bit. So, if you want impulse response to be matched, you use impulse invariant transformation technique. If you want frequency response to be matched, this, this is not a technique. You might ask a question, where would you use, where do you want to map impulse response? What application? Most of the filters, I mean your ear is a bandpass filter, 30,000 of bandpass filters inside. All. And those filters, to design those filters is not easy. How do you design those filters? You have to do measurements. So people have done measurements and they have measured impulse response at each point of the nerve cell. And those impulse response are available. So if you have that, you then fit an equation like that, and then you can the transform and get digital filters. So there are places where you've got analog impulse response available, and then if you want to get digitally, then use this technique. So let's look at an example. Ah, just a just the last part here. What I want to show you here is, you take a one single pole, this is pole, in analog domain, a single pole in analog domain, and transfer them into digital domain by this transformation technique. Basically, you will find, because it's only restricted to pi over t, the half the sampling, because response goes all the way through, you will find anything in that region, in the pi over t, is what is mapped here. So, you, if you go for other specs, they are also mapped. Remember, I just said you did the spectrum repeat. So, they are also mapped as well. So, this technique only works for mapping poles. You can't map zeros here. So here for S plus B, you can't map it. It does not work. So impulse invariance only maps the poles, not zeros. So remember that. It's important to know. So let me just do this example. Here's an example of analog filter. By looking at it, you don't know what filter it is, and you don't know how to calculate the digital filter coefficients. So first thing you have to do is you need to have something like S plus A4. We need to have in that form. So simply do a partial fraction. When you do a partial fraction, what happens is this becomes as one over s plus one, s minus three. Now you apply you have impulse invariant transformation for each part, that part and that part. If you apply that, you find for the first part of the first part here when you apply the impulse invariant transformation. That's what you get. For the second part, the impulse invariant transformation, that's what you get, second part of it. Now, if you combine them all together, here is your filter. And this filter can be written as, if you write that down, you will write as A naught set to the minus 1, it's that, equal to 1 minus B1 set to the minus 1 plus B2 set to the minus 2. That's your filter. A naught is that part, that's that filter coefficient. B1 is this part, that filter coefficient. And B2 is that part. So that is how you get your filter coefficients when you're doing filter design. Right, let's look at this example now. Here is the transfer of an analog filter is given to you, and you have been asked to use impulse invariance method to find the uh, transfer function of a discrete, um, uh, disc, uh, sorry, transfer function, a head set that is um, the, in the discrete domain. So if you start with the um, transfer function on Laplace domain, this one we can actually um, have to make sure that we 
we somehow um, factorize them. So when you factorize them, they become like this. And then you separate them into partial types, one and two. So that's basically going from here and then and then uh, finding out. So if you, could, if, you, if you make x plus a whole squared plus b squared is equal to zero, then you get s plus a whole squared is equal to minus b squared. Then you can say s plus uh, you can then say from here s plus a is equal to uh, j b plus of uh, there will be j b plus or minus and then s is equal to a plus or minus j b. So using that you got that one and then sorry this is minus and you go then this is minus. Okay. And so you got those two and then partial fraction. Once you've done the partial fraction, you find the value of A and B which you know how to do it, you've done it many times. And uh, and I just take the half outside here, both of them. So this is sure now your transfer function. Now we can apply this is in a particular form where now we can apply impulse invariant transformation for that first and then for that one. So we go to the next page. So impulse invariant transformation says if you've got one over x plus c, which is transferred to one over one minus e to ct. So wherever we have one over x plus c, we substitute to that. Similarly here as well. So if you want to go back and have a look, so that is substituted by uh, one minus e to the minus j, uh, e to the minus b and t, and similarly for that as well. So go back here. You can have that one and that one. Now you simplify this, and when you simplify them, your transfer function now becomes as this one. So you can say that's your coefficient, that's your first coefficient, that's your next coefficient, and that's your next coefficient. There are the three coefficients that you have for this particular filter. So this is how you transfer an, an analog filter into a digital filter using impulse invariant transformation. Hence the filter is like that. And you write down the coefficients individually. And then you write the transfer function. But it's all the same. You see, I'm not filtering. I'm mapping to this. So you can say, note that 0 at s equal to minus 8, that's a 0 on an analog domain, is not drawn to set equal to that in the discrete domain. But if you have only zeros, you can't map them. 0 and 4 are there, then you can map, map them. So the location of the zero in the discrete filter depends on the position of the poles uh, uh, as well as the zero of the analog filter. Now, second example, is using impulse invariant method and find the digital filter of a normalized digital filter. This is a normalized analog filter, you know, because this is one, that means normalized. So you have been given the cutoff frequency is 150 hertz, the SC is 150 hertz, and the sampling frequency is 1.28 kilohertz. That's given to you. So let's go back and first, before you do impulse invariant transformation, you need to denormalize. How do you denormalize it? You start with HS, substitute is equal to SO omega C. You get SO omega, uh, omega C, it's not S, sorry, SO omega C. Divide them, whole square, is wherever S you substitute. So that's S, you get that one. From that, you get, this is your denormalized transfer function. And you need to calculate omega C. Omega C is 2 pi into the cutoff frequency, which is 150 hertz. So that's what you get. So if you write it, your equation now becomes this. And this is the second order. So you can find the poles, S equal to P1 and P2 are the poles. And then, if you know the force, you can write them as A over B over, that's the partial fraction. So, this can be written as this. Now we can find P1 and P, P2 by just uh, using the um, quadratic formula, formula and, uh, and you can find P1 and P2. So, starting from here, you denormalize, then you make it in this form so that you can apply in-person transformation. Now, if you work out the pole 1 and pole 2, 
will be this one. This that obtained from this 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 equation s plus s plus root two omega c s plus omega c squared s plus root two omega c s plus omega c squared is equal to zero s i am s squared and uh, if you apply the the quadratic formula you get that one p one and p two they are the force they are imaginary force you can see that so you know the value of omega c you substitute them and p one becomes that P2 becomes this one, and I only substitute P1 is that, P2 is that, and then if you work your way through, A becomes complex, don't forget, and B becomes complex as well. They're not real. Uh, it's a long, long calculation, but just to show you the effect of that, once you complete that, you go and rewrite the equation. Now, that is your, because you've got two poles, so you substitute the equation variant transformation, so you got these two values. And you simplify this all the way through, and you get this equation. Now you go back and substitute A, B, all these values, you already have them, P1, P2. And if you simplify that, you get a solution like that. And you should try to work out this yourself and see whether you get this. Um, in, in, an, in an exam viewpoint, you won't get a, a complex one like that, but principle is important. You need to know how to do it. Once you do this, you can see here, basically, h theta, you calculate by substituting it for j theta. And if you try to calculate dc gain, that this is 1, this is 1, this is 1, the dc gain becomes 1, 2, 2, 3. That's the dc gain. Now you can find, the problem is, this dc gain can shift everything up like, you know, it's too high the dc gain, which is roughly equal to something frequency like, roughly. In an inverse invariant uh, transformation, this can happen. So, in that case, you know this is the gain. What we need to do is that this large gain is not really acceptable. So, what you do is we divide everything by the sampling frequency. So, if you divide the whole thing by the sampling frequency, you can just divide. It's the gain factor. This is the gain can be reduced. There's no problem. Not the coefficient, but just the gain. Gain means this value. So that value was 3 slash divided by sampling frequency it will become this one. And this is your transfer function now. This is your transfer function of, of, your, of your filter. And as you plot it, and this is your gain, which originally was 3, huh? something like that. And you ready? 3, sorry, have a look at it. Uh, 3, 9, 3. 3, 9, 3, and we divide by the sample we can just reduce the gain there. And now this is your digital filter. You start as the analog filter, you get a second order digital filter now. The output can be taken here or here, depends on what you want. If it's y n minus 1, you take it here on y n minus and you take it here. Now if you plot the impulse response, this is your analog oh, impulse response, you see that? And the digital impulse response will look like this. So sampling frequency, in summary, affects the frequency response of the digital filter by using input invariant transformation. Just to go through this before, I have already explained. This is your analog filter. You chose your sampling frequency here, 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 here. If you choose it here, you see the next part is going to come there. It's going to interact. If you choose your sampling frequency there, next part is like this. So it won't interact. But you can see that. You choose a sampling frequency, like SS. Uh, so this is your signal. Let me find this is zero. This is your half the sampling, and that's your analog spectrum going like that. Then your sampling is SS, and then it repeats as well. This can see there's aliasing here always. There's an aliasing here. If you want to really reduce the aliasing, you have to move that away, and everything moves that way. And then the tail comes very small in here, so aliasing can be minimized. So high sampling you need. To achieve this, you need very high sampling. So that's basically the, the, the uh, um, impulse invariant transformation that we have done. The next transformation that we do is the uh, bilinear transformation.
and uh, we will look at that um, uh, in a minute. 